today on Call Out. Kent Harrison's search and rescue first respond to a reported SOS, then go on a late night call out to locate four missing hikers. Three, two, one, blast. And later, Canadian SARTEC rookies complete parachute training with some very challenging jumps. Honestly, the scariest part would be sitting in the plane knowing that you're about to jump out of a, you know, perfectly good aircraft. Saturday, 10.15 a.m. Kent Harrison Search and Rescue launched their 20-foot boat, the Shearwater, into the ice-cold water of Harrison Lake, about two hours east of Vancouver. They have been tasked to search Echo Island for the source of a potential distress call. Uh, it's like an SOS, you know, we're investigating a flashing mirror. Could possibly be a distress signal. Uh, it's been noticed yesterday morning, yesterday afternoon, and again this morning. Maybe it's a person. Sometimes people use mirrors to signal a dis possible distress signal trying to get attention from passerbys, boaters, planes, what have you, using Morse code. We always take each one seriously because after all it comes in as a call out. And over the years we've learned that um, things are never as they first appear. Um, we tend to take a lot of equipment with us now because you just never know what you're gonna face, but you have to be prepared for anything. While the crew gets geared up, Search manager Neil Brewer plots the approximate location of the flashes on the mapping system. It's about 400 meters east. The coordinates will help guide the rescuers in the right direction. At this point, we hadn't seen the uh, signal, uh, but as we got closer to the island, we saw the possible distress signal. Go ahead, Neil. Yeah, you're pretty much right there instead of ahead of me. Yeah, we see the flash. Um, just trying to figure out what it is. The crew head towards the nearest cottage, which happens to be decorated with reflective garden ornaments. It's awful lot like the glitter things this guy has hanging all over the place. There's uh, reports of a reflective flash up there. There's a mirror up there. Oh, yeah. How did it get there? Somebody put it up there. Okay. As suspected, the source of the flashes turns out to be nothing more than a mirror dangling from a tree and reflecting sunlight. You get called out, you get the adrenaline pumping, you, you get out to the boat launch or to wherever it may be, and then it turns out it's nothing. You have to just turn around and go home, and then you have that adrenaline crash. And you're sort of, you know, like, why did we waste our time even coming? but you have to respond. We still felt that it was uh, the, the right thing to do to respond and, and make sure this, in fact, wasn't somebody with, with a, uh, an emergency situation. Search and rescue teams are no strangers to false alarms. They're simply part of the job. Uh, last seen 1,800 hours of the hang glider launch route now. I'd say approximately 10% are what we call stand downs. We may um, get stood down as we're leaving the base. Sometimes we get stood down en route. Sometimes we get stood down once we've got on scene and realize that, in fact, the situation has resolved itself. Conversely, what seems like a minor incident can evolve into a complicated and sometimes tragic still, mission. Uh, still one person missing. Through experience, we've found out that what may initially come in as a very simple situation can really go sideways on you very, very quickly. Uh, we have one code four. Subject code four, confirm. Whether it's a matter of life and death or simply a case of lending a helping hand, search and rescue volunteers are always ready and willing. Sunday, 7.48 p.m. Kent Harrison search and rescue members converge outside the Chehalis River hatchery, a 30-minute drive from their base in Agassiz, British Columbia. They've been requested by the RCMP to locate four subjects lost in the woods. 
Roommates Chloe Zhang and Kate Zhao, along with two other friends, got lost when they decided to follow the creek behind the hatchery into the woods, hoping to catch a glimpse of salmon spawning in the wild. It's a nice day, and they're going for an afternoon stroll, thinking that they'll come back right away. Despite a very weak cell phone signal, they were able to get through to 911. Luckily, when they made the 911 call, their phone was able to give a GPS coordinate, which we used for our searching. With the coordinates charted on the map, search managers are able to determine the subject's location within an error margin of roughly 100 meters. that they followed a trail that had flagging tape on it. Oh. We don't know what color the flagging tape was at this point. That was the team crazy. decides to head directly to the GPS located site, even though it means cutting straight through a very dense underbrush. It's not the easiest route, but it is the quickest. Not a, not a friendly hike. Um, lots of bushwhacking, uh, logs to climb over, or, or under for that matter. Carrying radios with built-in GPS locators, the ground search team is tracked in real time by managers inside the command vehicle. Right, team one, check your compasses and then move off. Through the GPS mics, we can guide them towards the location of the subject's GPS coordinate. Heavy underbrush over. At this very moment, about one kilometer away, the subjects are literally shaking in their boots. We don't have any food or water, and we even forgot our coat in vehicle. It was getting cold. It was really freezing there. But being cold was the least of their concerns. At first, we were talking and uh, even making some jokes because we think we are going to be re rescued very soon. After an hour, I was worrying that there might be some dangerous animals in the woods. Bears or cougars. I heard some stories <laughs> about what happened in the woods. Fortunately, they didn't have to outrun cougars in their high-heeled boots. Search and rescue was near. The search team used their whistles and we did a coordinated whistle blast from command and then they would wait for a minute so that they can hear any, if there's any voices. We did get a response during one of our whistle blasts and so we know then that we were very close to our subjects. Thank goodness for cell phones, eh? Oh, they were so nice. Um, I was deeply touched because they have uh, blankets and they give them to us. Thank you so much for all this work. That's the best blanket I ever had. <laughs> because the four subjects are inappropriately dressed for a trek through the thick brush, the team decides to lead them out the long way, back along the trail, the way they had come. But even this proved to be difficult. I was wearing boots, and there were those big rocks along the beach, and uh, I, just, I just can't do it with all my boots, so I just took them off and walked with their feet. Nearly an hour later, they make it out of the woods. You guys are the best. Oh, thanks. Thank you very much. Oh, you're most welcome. I think we dragged them out uh, from, from home to save us. I think they were enjoying their family time. I was very grateful for them. I think Mick's going to go and show them take down where they went. So I suggest people to um, research the area you're going and uh, I mean, no high heels. That's my advice. Oh my God. Can I take 
The subjects did the right thing by calling for help and staying put. But, as with most call-outs, the whole scenario could have been avoided. Even if you're going for a short afternoon hike, it's best to not dress as though you're going shopping at the mall. Had their cell phones failed to work, no doubt they would have given a whole new meaning to the term fashion victims. Now, Canadian Sartec rookies complete parachute training and brace for real rescue action. They get the idea what it's like in the event that they have to actually go into a crash in bad weather, which is typically when these guys do have to go out for missions, say. When someone is in distress in the wilderness, the Canadian Forces search and rescue technicians leap into action, no matter how far the location or hostile the environment. Their preferred mode of transportation? The parachute. We have to give these guys a mode of transportation to get down to the ground. Whether it's parachuting or hoisting out of an aircraft uh, to get down to a, a boat that's in trouble or an airplane that's crashed or uh, a lost hunter or whatever the case may be, that's, that's our means of getting there. Once we're there, we rely on our medical skills to render medical aid to the guys that are in trouble. Over the last seven weeks, these 13 recruits training to become Sartex have jumped at least twice a day, every day. Definitely for me, the, the whole para phase has been the most challenging. I've never uh, jumped out of a plane before the course, so it's a pretty, uh, pretty frightening experience the first time. 11th jump, I had a parachute malfunction, that was scary. Honestly, the scariest part would be sitting in the plane knowing that you're about to jump out of a, you know, perfectly good aircraft. The whole parachute phase is designed to take them from knowing nothing and progressing them through all the phases, all the theory and the knowledge, all the skills, the practical applications of parachuting. They've come a long way since the first week of training. All right, fellas, first jump for today. But before the students can move on to the next phase in their SARTEC course, they must face one last daunting challenge, a low altitude jump. With a lower altitude opening on our static line, okay, it's not a big deal. Okay, nice These guys are going to go out and do a low altitude 1,500 foot jump under static line. It's a culmination of everything that they've learned. It's a little bit of a pucker factor for sure for these guys. The other thing that can happen is going out, not having that positive exit and getting that clean attitude out of the aircraft and coming down that slide. Jumping from 1,500 feet is considered very risky, even for professional parachutists. In fact, the Canadian Sport Parachuting Association recommends jumping at no lower than 2,200 feet. Not a lot of but when it comes to saving lives out in the real world, Sartex can't always choose what conditions they'll deploy in. So, when you want to take into consideration... They get the idea what it's like in the event that they have to actually go into a crash in bad weather, which is typically when these guys do have to go out for, for missions, say. All right, any questions? Ready to move here in five minutes. Just push the button. There you go, that's all. Thanks, Kurt. Oh. <laughs> Just turning off the uh, emergency deployment because we're jumping too low, so you don't have time for it to go off. I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> He's the man. I usually jump and get hurt, so I just fix everything else. <laughs> the trainees admit to feeling a little nervous. It's pretty risky. I mean, uh, there's not much time for reactions. So you uh, have to know your drills. Uh, procedures and then uh, you have to set up your pattern quickly. The instructors on the other hand are not worried. Sartex routinely deploy at even lower altitudes. It's one of the lower jumps they've done so far they'll do lower but that's uh, we're in training environment right now so 1500 feet is the lowest we can put them out. What makes this possible is their specialized ram air canopies which are designed for easy maneuvering, even while carrying close to 45 kilos of life-saving equipment. 
this canopy that the students are flying is built to carry heavy loads. It's a bigger canopy and it's uh, essentially a wing and uh, acts very much like an airframe. You can turn it left, turn it right by deflecting the tail. You can glide it, make it plane out, trim the canopy so it'll fly uh, horizontally and lose a lot less vertical descent. You can dive it and we need it to be that maneuverable to get into the areas that we have to penetrate via parachute to do our job. He's coming into an entry point right now and he's probably about a thousand feet. So he's making those turns to get separation from that other guy so they don't have problems when they get down low. So he's on a downwind leg now. And depending on his altitude or how it looks to him, he'll just keep coming around to final. Now he's right into wind. Set up for the center of the pea gravel bowl. And you'll see him come down to a first stage, first stage, and then a finish. It only takes about 80 seconds from exit to landing. That's our chief, uh, Chief Warren Officer John Oak. First stage, plane out the canopy, and finish. Nice. Textbook. Yeah, by the time you get out and you do all your safety checks on your parachute, you're already sitting at a thousand feet, so it's pretty quick, so you're coming on final for your landing already. What they do, they, they see, they visualize what's called sail. So the canopy is jumping out of the pack tray and it actually sails forward. And if they're looking for that sail, they'll see the, see the riser groups in front of them. So as soon as they see the riser group, it's a matter of grabbing those riser groups, keeping them separated. That prevents a lot of the twists that you'll see people in the air twisted up and they have to kick out. So this guy did a picture perfect or what's called a textbook. Once he's seen the sail up on the risers, hold it, canopy, the canopy develops, and he's able to carry on with his post deployment procedures. Corporal Swanson is not so lucky. His lines are twisted and he must spin around several times to straighten them out so that the canopy will function properly. I don't know, it jumped out and then there was twists. In yeah. My, my parachute. I knew what was wrong with it. It took a while to sort out, so didn't know if I was going to make it to the drop zone or not, but it all worked out pretty good. With military precision, all 13 rookies successfully complete their 1500 foot jump. Okay guys, so really good job this morning on the static line. This afternoon, free fall, same skid as yesterday. Okay, be smart. Okay, it's gonna be the same thing. It's gonna be two out, two out on one stick. Back same at base, the, the Sartex get briefed on their final jump of the para phase. After this, they'll move on to the mountain operations phase in Jasper, Alberta. So we're gonna get probably up to around 12.5. They're calling the ceiling somewhere between 12,000 and 13,000 feet. Sartex don't typically carry out freefall jumps in a real-world rescue, but after seven weeks of hard work, the students deserve a little fun. In here, okay? Not here, not Argus over in here. What you're basically looking for is a feature on the ground to track away from each other. So let's do that, okay? Five grand, everybody stops what they're doing. 4,500, turn and burn, dump at 35. Question. All right, so get ready to move. There's a time and a place to be militant, and then there's time to, to kind of relax and just take a step back and just, you know, training environment, put them in a relaxed setting and, and get them, you know, being comfortable under canopy. Brimming with confidence, the students eagerly anticipate the thrill of free falling 7,000 feet. You get to have some fun now, get, to get a free fall in, get a reward from the boss. And it's pretty fun, yeah, everybody's excited about it. At this speed of exit, about 140 kilometers per hour, jumpers don't experience the sensation of falling. The resistance of air creates a feeling of weight pressing up against their body. It's crazy. <laughs> you can even feel the, the drops, the, like in the clouds. Oh, it's crazy, it's fun. Oh. 
As the paraphase enters the final days, these Sartek students are now able to use yet another highly specialized skill in their life-saving profession. The start of the course, I didn't even, even sure if I was gonna jump out of the plane, so wow. getting to this part was pretty, uh, pretty good for me, so. Now 60, 62 jumps later, so it's pretty good. Old pro now. No, I wouldn't say that. Still not landing on the X, but I'm getting there. These students will all face the ultimate challenge of going pro when in the final operational phase, their life-saving skills will be tested for certification as Canadian Forces search and rescue technicians. Call out search and rescue features, real stories filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.